the time starts. And like my name's the first one. So <laughs> I used to lock the door to my class. Yeah. You lock the door? Late students could come in. Oh my gosh. That's when I was over in the UAE. The Did students you do there have a real problem. No, I just locked the door out. So I well, he does a huge attendance rate, like a yeah. big chunk. I'd be genuinely devastated if you did. Me too. He's gonna do it one I day. would knock on the door though. No. Sometimes that happened, we just ignored him. Oh, jeez. I got the message eventually. Brandy probably would have knocked this door. I'm going to make a couple of emails. It's not, not so much a problem here as it was over there. Oh, wait, where was that? UAE. I have some friends in the Middle East. Do you go like that often? Oh, dang. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I heard over yeah. there, like, people don't really have a big sense of time. It's just kind of like... It varies. Break it down. Okay, so um, today we're going to continue talking about pumps and your pump homework assignments available now on Blackboard. Um, it's due on Wednesday and also on Wednesday we're going to have our midterm exam. Um, there's a four page equation packet that's available now that I'll print out. Um, I think it's probably only the first page or maybe the first two that are applicable at this point. The, the packet that's on there includes equations for the entire course. But I'll print those out, and in addition to me providing that, you can also bring a page of your own notes. And so my suggestion is that on that page of notes, you maybe um, remind yourself certain procedures, like what's the logic or the procedure behind a um, three reservoirs problem, or what sorts the column headings would you put in if you're doing a loop method calculation you know, related to Excel. And then bring a computer with MS Excel. Uh, <laughs> it's like I'm from Philadelphia or something. All right, there we go. That's better. So, any questions on the announcements? Yeah. On the Excel, will we get like a like the student the formatting that you gave us? No. This be a blank sheet. Yes. Yeah. So any, <laughs> any reminders that you want to give yourself on the method should be included on that page of notes that you prepare. Other questions? He said it's all going to be calculation, no conceptual? That's right. Yep. Anything else? OK. So today we're going to work on affinity laws and then um, Assuming I think that we'll finish that relatively quickly, then I have an additional practice problem related to the nodal method, just to kind of reinforce those concepts. So um, when we have pumps working together in either parallel or in series, then they behave differently than if you just have a single pump. Um, so there's a need for us to have a way to analyze pumps working together. And there's also the issue that sometimes pumps are going to be used at a different speed than they originally would operate at. Now, it seems uh, counterintuitive, but most pumps are just designed to operate at a single speed, and it's actually less common to have a pump that's variable. And the reason for that is that, remember, pumps are connected to a motor, and motors are most efficient <laughs> at just a single operating point, and so you know, whatever RPMs that motor does when you plug it in is kind of the default setting for a different, for a certain pump and motor combination. Um, it's possible to get any pump and motor, uh, virtually any pump and motor, to operate at different uh, flow rates if you have something called a variable frequency drive. And it's actually a really expensive, complicated piece of equipment that changes electricity from 60 hertz to maybe 59 hertz or 58 hertz. And so it's changing the amplitude of the, uh, of the sine wave in electricity to try and get the pump to operate at a different rate. So the point is, is that a pump that is designed for 120 RPM, for example, is going to behave very differently when you run it at 100 RPM, or I guess they'd be a lot higher than that generally. But when you have different settings, you're going to get different performance. And it's not just a linear scaling. It's not as simple as saying that a pump that normally is operating at 1,000 RPMs, if you operate it at 900 RPMs, that doesn't mean you're getting 90% of the pump head. It doesn't mean you're going to get 90% of the flow rate. It's a nonlinear relationship. And so these equations are what we can use to understand what happens when you change how a pump is being operated with its rotational rate or if you change the diameter of the impeller in a pump. And there are pumps that are often sold 
as kind of an analogous series or they have a similar shape. There would be a manufacturer that has like a four inch pump, a six inch pump, an eight inch pump, and they all have a similar design in terms of the inlet structure, a similar impeller, um, and so they have a lot of common uh, performance characteristics, but because of the different diameter, they are designed to operate at different flow rates and generate different pump heads. So we're going to go through today and kind of analyze how you would use these pumps at different settings. Um, the basic idea is, is that if you know the, uh, for instance, the diameter of one pump and the diameter of another pump and you want to find out how the flow rate would change, in this case you can see that the flow rate of pump number two compared to the flow rate of pump number one would be a function of the diameter cubed. And so in this case it's a cubic relationship rather than a linear relationship. And we can do similar things in looking at the power requirements for pumps. You can substitute in comparing one pump to another where you know how the pump behaved under one set of circumstances you'd put on the left side of the equation and these new set of circumstances you'd substitute on the right side of the equation and it would tell you maybe a ratio of the power consumption under one case to the power consumption under another. So just to illustrate how these pump equations fit together, let's consider the case of a pump that normally uses a 1200 RPM motor, has an 8 inch diameter impeller, and so um, the 1200 RPM is what we would substitute into the rotational speed. The 8 inch impeller is what we'd put into the D, the diameter impeller. And this is the performance curve that we'd get under these conditions. Now this wouldn't be the performance curve if we change the rotational rate to 2400 though. And so what we can do is we can find the equation that relates 1h sub p in terms of another using this middle equation. Um, and you can see that the diameter in part A, that D1 and D2 are equal. But what you'll do is you'll find the, uh, the ratio of one head in terms of the other by substituting this pump equation and all of the rotational rate, the diameter, the new rotational rate into the applicable equations. And so let me pause for a minute and give you a moment to start thinking about this. And then I'll just illustrate the first one. I'll illustrate part A, and then I'll have you do B and C independently once you begin to think and start to set it up a bit. So at the very least for now, identify the variables that we're going to be substituting into these equations. Okay, here on the whiteboard I've written, we've got situation one and situation two. Situation one is the rotational rate is 1200 RPM, the diameter is eight inches, and now um, although this pump performance curve says H sub P, this H that it's talking about is the same thing as the capital H. By the way, this formatting, these equations, that's what it looks like in the FE reference manual. So that's why I'm showing you what variable definitions are because that's where you may be likely to see it again in the future. So um, I said capital H, meaning the pump head, is 12 meters minus 0 0.1 times Q, Q squared. And the Q that it's talking about here in this first equation is the flow rate under condition 1. Condition 1 when we have the 8 inch impeller and the 1200 RPM. So what we have is H1 and Q1, and we want to find out um, H2 in terms of Q2. So in terms of Q2. And, um, and so to do that, we've got this equation that we can substitute into and get a ratio of Q1 in terms of Q2. And then the other equation that we're going to be substituting. So the first equation that we substitute into is the top one. And then there's also the middle equation, which is H1 divided by N1 squared D1 squared is equal to H2 
divided by n2 squared times d2 squared. Okay. So every place you know one of these variables, so for example, we know n1, we know n2, we know d1, we know d2, find q1 in terms of q2 and h1 in terms of h2. And then what we're going to do is we're going to substitute what is h1 in terms of h2 on the left side and on the right side substitute in q1 in terms of q2. Okay, so let me look, let me show you what the uh, the first expression is going to look like. We want to find q1 relative to q2. And so having this equation that's in the box, we're going to be able to substitute that to the right side of our existing pump performance curve. And so when we find the new pump performance curve, what we're going to be doing is we're going to say uh, 0.1 times 0.5 q square, uh, q2 and then square that. So we're going to drop in this q1 <laughs> up here in the original pump performance curve. And then the same thing with our relationship that relates H1 and H2. So here's the relationship of H1 and H2. So if we substitute and isolate H1 on the left-hand side of the equation, on the right-hand side you can see that we've got the original rotational rate squared divided by the second rotational rate squared. So um, we know the, the ratio of uh, Q1 and Q2, H1 and H2, and then we substitute these two into the original pump performance curve. And so we make that substitution on the left side where it was just H1, the pump head under condition 1. Here on the right side where we're, we're substituting in the brackets there, what used to just be Q1. And then doing the math of solving for the new performance curve. If we spin it twice as fast, so going from 1200 to 2400 RPM, what it means is it's uh, quadrupling our cutoff head. So before, this original pump performance curve where it was saying H1 is 12 minus 0.1 Q1 squared, the 12 represents the maximum height the pump can lift the water. Uh, it's you know, the, the biggest delta Z that we could expect the pump to lift the water. And it can only do that. It can only work against 12 meters of head at a very, very low, essentially no flow rate. As the flow rate goes up, then the pump head it can deliver decreases. So in this case, by doubling the rotation rate, what it means is the cutoff head went from 12 meters to 48 meters. So um, it's giving us uh, a pretty good increase in the pump head that it's able to add to the system. It's adding a lot more energy to the system if you're rotating that pump twice as fast. All right. So this is analogous pumps. Now, for the uh, part B, it's saying, what is the performance curve if the original 1,200 RPM motor is used, but we change to a 10-inch impeller? So now it's the same process. You have um, this expression for condition 1. And in condition 2, the n is the same for 1 and 2, but it's the d that's changing. And so consider this process that we just solved. Now, in this time, n1 and n2 are equal, but what's changing is the d's. And you'll notice that we have to cube the diameters. And so there's probably going to be an even more dramatic change um, from this change in diameter. Thank you.
Okay, so in part A of the example, we took a certain pump and we put on a new motor. The new motor spins twice as fast as the old motor does. And so it took us from 12 to 48 meters of cutoff head. And this coefficient at the front kind of uh, remained unchanged. In the second part, it's saying, well, what if we use the same motor but take that original motor and put it onto a pump that's a little bit bigger, a pump with a larger impeller. And so it's still spinning at 1200 RPM, but the channel through the pump has a larger diameter than the original 8 inch. So in that case, here's the, uh, the new numbers here. So N1 and N2 are both 1200 in this second scenario. D1 is 8, D2 is 10. So the, uh, the two relationships that we have to use to rearrange to have to relate Q1 and Q2 and then relate H1 and H2 because we're going to substitute that back into the original pump performance curve to find a new pump performance curve. So these uh, analogous relationships just kind of tell you um, how the flow rate and pump head change according to certain parameters and so we get Q1 and Q2, H1 and H2 related, substituted into the original pump performance curve. And so then the resulting means that the, uh, the cutoff head goes up, but not as much. It doesn't go up as dramatically. The advantage that we get, though, is that the original coefficient was 0.1. And so you can think of that as that's the slope that the curve is going down as the flow rate decreases. And so if I was to sketch our original pump, pump performance curve. The original pump performance curve was like this. It was 12 meters, and then it was tapering relatively quickly. Then when we took it up to, this is 1,200 RPM. Here was the 2,400 <coughs> RPM, and it went all the way up to 48. So switching to the 10-inch uh, diameter, it increases the cutoff head, but then it flattens out the curve. And so it's not declining as quickly. So it's more suitable for a high flow rate. You're, gonna, you're going to uh, be able to maintain a high flow rate as the, uh, as the pump is put under load. So this coefficient here, the 0 0.04, just means that you're losing less pump head as the flow rate increases. All right, so if you need a pump to source water 30 feet above the original source, what option is best? So uh, we wouldn't be able to lift the water that far because the cutoff of 12 or the cutoff of 18. So the 2400 RPM scenario was the one that gave us the, uh, the cutoff head that's above 30 feet. You had the cutoff of 48. So you have a homework problem that is similar to this illustration. Uh, actually, I think that there may be two homework problems. One of them is a little bit tricky. And let me pull that up now so that I can give you a couple of hints on that. So what you've seen so far is an actual equation for the pump performance curve. But sometimes it's an actual graphical curve, and it's not an equation. And so that's the case here in this problem number four. We have a given system curve. And remember, the system curve is generated by looking at uh, the delta z the friction loss coefficients through the pipe. So the system curve, is that's just the energy equation, is where the system curve comes from. Problem four wants to know what flow rate are you going to achieve when you match this pump with this given system curve. And so what you need to do to solve this one is you need to digitize this curve. You need to turn it into an equation. 
um, you know, of the form that's similar to this, where there is a y-intercept and then some uh, form that is like uh, y-intercept minus a coefficient times the flow rate squared. And so I give you a little suggestion of how you could set that up with Excel, where in one column, you, what you're going to need to do is print this out and write on the paper. And so for 5 meters of flow rate, what is the head? For 10 meters of flow rate, what is the pump head? And so you know, digitize this curve and put it into a spreadsheet, maybe in units of 5 cubic feet per second. What is the, the H value for each one of those? And then guess a C value. That coefficient is what defines the, the taper of this declining head. So the curve of it is defined by this C value in the equation. And so you can uh, try and have a comparison between a guess that you'd get from a coefficient. You know, start with maybe C is 0.1. So if you had C is 0.1, then what would the equation predict for the Q excuse me, predict for the H sub P for a given flow rate Q. Because that's what this equation is doing, is you put in a flow rate and it predicts an H sub P. And so you know the relationship between Q and H sub P. You just need an equation for it so that you can set the two equations equal to each other and solve for Q. So you can't, um, I guess you could sketch graphically to get a, a general idea. You know, this is the uh, pump head, you could sketch this and find the operating point, you know, like a, a graphing calculator. But the way that I did this one was I made the equation. I took this physical graph and I want to know what equation in the form of h equals y-intercept minus coefficient times q squared. And so you kind of have to do not a linear regression because it's not a linear curve, but a regression of a sort because you're going to be looking at the difference between the known um, head and the, the head that the equation gives you for a certain flow rate. And then you want to sum up the differences and minimize the difference. So start thinking about it. You've got until Wednesday. And uh, if you make some progress on it, you can stop by my office and I'll tell you like um, what my equation looked like. But I don't want to spoil it too much because I think this is good practice to um, figure out numerical methods like generating your own pump curve from a given figure. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. yeah, so pumps will be included as a topic on the exam that you're having next Wednesday. Okay. Uh, any other questions about affinity laws before we move on to the nodal method practice? Okay. okay, here's a problem that many years ago when I gave more quizzes than I did now, this was a quiz question back in those olden days. And uh, I've repurposed it to give you some extra practice on the nodal method. So what we have is one of those scenarios where the flow splits. And uh, what do you remember about the head loss between x and y? x is the upstream junction. y is the downstream junction. What's kind of the governing idea that we use to solve a nodal method problem like this? What is it? Okay, that's one good point. Yeah, that the flow rate through B and the flow rate through C have to equal the flow rate through A. And so one aspect of this method is that we use continuity where we say that the flow rate through the two pipes after it splits is equal to the flow rate prior to the split. So that's continuity at the junction. Now what about the head losses though? The, uh, the decrease in head between x and y, there's a certain trick that I related to uh, going skiing. Do you remember what's that concept there that's about the energy loss? So that they're equal, the uh, energy loss in the pipe is equal? 
The energy lost through each pipe is equal. Exactly right. So it doesn't matter whether you go through pipe B or whether you go through pipe C, the H sub F, the head loss due to pipe friction, is the same through both path, uh, same through both paths. And that's how we solve this problem, is we set the head losses equal to each other. So we say H sub F through pipe B equals H sub F through pipe C. Now the equations are on the back, the formulas that you can use. And so there's the Darcy-Wiesbach equation, there's the Jane equation, the Colebrook is there, you know, a variety of equations. You won't need all of them. What I'd like you to do is find the flow rate through each pipe, and then as a part B, find the pressure at junction Y, assuming that all of the elevations are equal. So we know the pressure at junction X is uh, 565 kilopascals. So what is the pressure at junction Y? So the first step is to set H sub F for pipe B equal to the H sub F through pipe C. And adapting the, um, the Darcy-Wiesbach equation in terms of flow rate. You know, the formula that's on the page there has it in terms of velocity, but in terms of flow rate, it's F L Q squared divided by D 2 G A squared. So what we're saying is, is that F B L B Q B squared divided by D B uh, 2 G A B is equal to F L Q squared divided by D 2 G A squared. All of those things for pipe C. So if you want to check your work, I've got the flow rate through pipe C and the flow rate through pipe B on the screen there. Setting the two friction losses equal to each other is how we get the relationship between B and C. And then we substitute into the continuity equation at the junction, where we're saying that the flow in must equal the flow out. And because I owe you a minute and don't intend to keep you uh, late again today, let me just give you a general overview of how to answer the second part of the question. So it's asking in the second part of the question, question, what is the pressure at Y? So we know the pressure at X. We want to know the pressure at Y. So we just calculate the loss through the pipe. So for 0.109 cubic meters per second. If we substitute that into the function for the friction loss through pipe B, we'll get that there's a certain amount of head loss through that pipe. And so the, the head at location Y is the head that there was at X minus the losses through that pipe. And so if we have um, 57.59 is the total head at X, and subtract the losses, then what's left over is that there's 22.68 meters of head once it gets to Y. And then we can express that as a pressure by multiplying it by the unit weight. So it would be 222.5 kilopascals. And you could have also done it through pipe, uh, through pipe C. You know, here I, I did it in terms of this Q sub B flow rate. You don't have to. You could have found out the same head loss through pipe C. So you could have used the uh, 0 0.041 cubic meters per second and substituted in H sub F pipe C. But that's the general idea with this uh, nodal method is that we are setting the losses equal to each other and continuity at a junction. Okay, so that's all for today. Remember that this homework 
Uh, number six is available now. Get an early start on that confusing kind of like uh, digitization problem. That way you can know if you're on track. And if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. I'll let you know if, if you're doing it right. All right, that's it for today. Thank <laughs> you.